count as eligible employment? And their answer was no. And I would also encourage you to print out the employment certification form. And this is that form. So here's the form. As I said, you would fill out the first page, which is basically providing your demographic information. And then you'd read the certification statement and sign it. Then you would submit it to your employer. They would fill out their name, address, and federal tax ID number. Then you would they would provide your dates of employment uh, from when you began until you ended. And if you're still employed there, they'd give the current date. Then they would indicate whether you're full-time or part-time, and then how many hours per week on average are you working. Then they would indicate what type of organization were they. A government agency, a nonprofit tax-exempt organization under 501c3 of the tax code, or a private nonprofit that isn't a 501c3, but that is providing certain types of public services. Now, you'll notice that there are a couple of examples or a couple of situations where even though you're working for what would appear to be a qualifying employer, that employment would not count. If you're working for a government agency, there is one category of employment that doesn't count with government agency, and that is if you are working as an elected member of the U.S. Congress. They exempted themselves from being able to benefit from this program. So members of the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate are not eligible for public service loan forgiveness. Everyone else, including the President, are considered eligible employees. Now, otherwise, any kind of government employment would count. It doesn't matter what you're doing. What about a private nonprofit? As long as it's not a labor union or a partisan political organization, then it's going to count. Unless the nature of your work and this would be true with both the 501c3 nonprofit as well as a non as well as a private nonprofit. Your work cannot involve time spent on religious act instruction, worship services, or proselytization. And that's all listed down here in this note. So there are a few exceptions to uh, nonprofit employment based upon what you're doing that you would not be considered doing qualifying employment. Other than that, as long as you meet those requirements, it would be eligible. Your employer would then sign and date the form, and then you would submit the form, as I said, to Fed Loan Servicing. They would process it, as I indicated. Any questions about this form or about the information on the website? Um, so, you, so we should be filling out this form even though the first day of eligibility is not for a couple of years? The question is, should you be filling out this form even though the first date you could actually apply for forgiveness isn't for several years? And the answer is yes. This is not the application for forgiveness. This is a form that allows you to find out have you been doing or are you currently doing qualifying employment and to provide documentation to the government that hopefully will support your claim when you do apply for the forgiveness that you've done qualifying employment. So you'd want to start doing this as soon as you've at least started, done several months of qualifying employment. You don't want to do it as soon as you start a job because you haven't really put in any time yet. It'd have to be at least a several months, and they actually recommend that you do it after the first 12 months, and then every time you change jobs or every 12 months thereafter. And then um, you were saying before that it's loan dependent, not borrower dependent for when the time period starts, right? So if you consolidate, does that restart your time period? Uh, the question is, I mentioned that this is a benefit that's at the loan level, and therefore it doesn't count uh, unless the loan has been in repayment for 120 months and you did qualifying employment on that loan for 120 months. Yes, if you refinance a loan through consolidation for that loan, it's been paid off, so now the clock starts over. But you don't have to refinance direct loans. So you wouldn't want to refinance any loans that are already direct loans because that would start the clock over. But you'd have to refinance loans that aren't currently eligible, so they, the clock wouldn't even have started yet. Other questions? All right. So let's go back to the presentation. Any questions about public service loan forgiveness? Again, I would recommend that if you have more questions, Go out to that website and print out the Q&As and that uh, employment certification form and read through the fact sheet. If not, I do want to quickly go over IBR and Payjour because, as I mentioned, you have to be using one of these two payment plans if you want the payments to count because these are the plans that would result in you paying the least amount 
and therefore it would be maximizing the amount of debt potentially that you could have forgiven. And what is the difference between the two? With income-based repayment, both direct and FFDL loans are eligible. And with this particular plan, the annual amount you're paying on your student loans is equal to 15% of your discretionary income. And we'll define what discretionary income is in a few minutes. And if you don't qualify for loan forgiveness, but if there's still debt remaining in this, after making payments in this plan for 25 years, any debt remaining at that point in time would be canceled. Although, whereas the loan forgiveness in the public service loan forgiveness program is viewed as not taxable, any amount canceled is currently viewed under the tax code as being a taxable benefit, although Congress certainly could change that. But again, this cancellation benefit is not a guaranteed aspect of your promise revenue. With pay-as-you-earn, only direct loans are eligible. The annual amount paid is one-third less. It's 10% of your discretionary income rather than 15%. Loan cancellation occurs after 20 years rather than 25 years. But there's also a couple of additional eligibility requirements for the borrower. For you to be eligible for pay-as-you-earn, you have to be a new borrower as of October 1st, 2007. And you'll be a new borrower if one of two things is true. Either you never borrowed any FFDL or direct loans prior to October 1st of 2007. You could have borrowed a Perkins loan before that date because that doesn't impact your definition of a new borrower. But you can't have borrowed any Stafford, Grad Plus, or Consolidation loans through either the FFDL or the direct program prior to October 1st of 2007. Or, if you did borrow FFEL or direct loans prior to October 1st of 2007, they were fully repaid by the time you took out your first new direct or FFEL loan after October 1st of 2007. So if you have loans from undergrad or a prior degree program that still haven't been repaid, and you borrow those, at least one of those loans before October 1st of 2007, you don't meet this requirement. If you've only taken out loans since you've come to the law school, you do meet this requirement because you would have taken out your first loan no sooner than probably sometime in August of 2010 or later. But if you meet the new borrower requirement, you also have to meet a second condition, and that is you had to have a disbursement of a direct loan on or after October 1st of 2011. Now, since you're still enrolled, you'll meet that requirement. It's the first one that's going to be the hurdle. Any questions about this? If you're not sure, how could you find out if you meet this requirement? Uh, what was the first website? Uh, NS. NSLDS, that's right. If you go into the details of NSLDS by clicking on that little blue box, in the details, it's going to tell you in the middle of the screen the disbursement history of the loans. And so you can see when was the first disbursement made on that loan. And if it was prior to October 1st of 2007, and if that loan has not been paid off, then you're not a new borrower. What other place could you go, or what other source could you contact? Who's, I heard somebody whispering, <laughs> but it's not the person I want to answer the question. Okay. <laughs> Who is managing your loans? Starts with an S. The servicer. The company that I mentioned, if you go into the details, you can find out who is the company servicing your loans. Right now, it's probably one of four companies. Fed Loan Servicing, out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Great Lakes, out of Madison, Wisconsin. Nelnet, out of Lincoln, Nebraska. <coughs> or Sally Mae, out of who knows where. <laughs> I don't know. They're, they're rather ubiquitous. All right? Either checking in SLDS or checking with your servicer. If you're not sure, they should be able to confirm for you if you meet this requirement. So, in order to qualify for IBR or page or in terms of entering the plan, you also have to have what's called the partial financial hardship. And this will be true if the amount you would have been required to pay under the standard 10-year plan at the time you entered repayment was an amount greater per month than the amount you'd be required to pay based upon your income. If that's true, then you have a partial financial hardship and you're eligible to enter the plan. And once you're in the plan, you're never kicked out. And if you have a partial financial hardship, then your monthly payment is based upon your household adjusted gross income, your household size, and the federal poverty guideline. Your household adjusted gross income is always going to be your adjusted gross income, essentially your gross earning from wages and other income that you might earn from interest or dividend income, 
But if you're married, it's also going to include the income of your spouse. And here we're using the federal definition of marriage, not any state-defined definition. But only counts your spouse's income if you and your spouse file a joint federal tax return. If you file separately, then it does not include your spouse's income. And it never includes the income of anyone else, regardless of your relationship to them. Now, if you and your spouse do file jointly, which there are some tax benefits for doing that, and if your spouse also has eligible federal student loan debt, then his or her federal student loan debt is also going to get factored into the calculation and the determination of whether or not you have a harsh financial hardship. Household size is not a function of how you file your taxes. It always includes you, and it always includes your spouse if married, even if you and your spouse file separately. It always includes your biological or adopted children for whom you provide at least more than 50% of their support, regardless of who they may live with and regardless of who may claim them as a dependent on a tax return. But it also includes anyone else who is residing in your household full time for whom you're providing more than 50% of their support, such as a parent, a sibling, a stepchild, or a domestic partner. It does not matter what their relationship to you is. It just has to be the case that they're living with you full time and you are providing more than 50% of their support. Then once we have those definitions, we can look at how is the monthly payment calculated. And remember I said that it's in case of IBR, it's equal to 15% annually of what's defined as your discretionary income. Well, your discretionary income is that portion of your household's adjusted gross income that exceeds 150% of the federal poverty guideline for your household size and state of residence. Because this portion of your income, the government feels you need that to cover your basic subsistence needs. Food, shelter, and clothing. And so they're saying you really can't contribute from that. Well, that amount is not all that great. Currently, for a household size of one living in the 48 states, 150% of the poverty guideline would be $16,755 per year. Well, that's just a little over about $1,300 a month, which is probably less than what you're living on as a law student here at the law school. So it's not a lot of money, but obviously this, this amount is dependent upon the household size because the more people in your household, literally the more mouths you have to feed. So the more income you need for basic needs, so the less income you have that's discretionary. But whatever is discretionary, 15% of that is what the government says you should be contributing annually in the IBR plan. So the monthly amount would be one twelfth of that. With uh, pay as you earn, it's 10% rather than 15%. And here are some charts that show you what the monthly payments would be uh, using the 2012 Poverty Guideline, which, by the way, is still <coughs> the current Poverty Guideline. The new Poverty Guideline for 2013 has not yet been announced. I suspect it's not going to be changed for 2013. And whenever it does change, it just goes up. It never goes down. So the numbers in this chart for any given level of income will never get larger. They should only get smaller over time. And obviously, the bigger the household, the less discretionary income, therefore the smaller the monthly payment. Now, if we look at $50,000, or well, let's look at $70,000, we see that six sixty-six. If we go to the page you earn, we see that seventy thousand is four forty-four. It's one third less. So that's why I said, if you qualify for page you earn, that would be the plan you'd want to choose. If what you're trying to do is to maximize the amount of debt that gets forgiven, because you're going to be paying less with page you earn for any given level of income or household size than under the IBR plan. But you may not be eligible for pay as you earn, but you should be eligible for IBR. And as you might expect, if you notice from these charts, you don't actually have to have income to be on the plan. If your income is zero, your monthly payment is zero. In fact, if you have no discretionary income, if the amount of your household adjusted gross income for your household size is less than 150% of the poverty guideline for your household size, then you have either zero or negative discretionary income, in which case your monthly payment would be zero. Well, you're not even paying the interest that's accruing then, are you? Well, that's not a good thing because it means your debt's actually getting bigger, and that's not really the point of repayment. But if it means the difference between being able to afford your monthly payment and also being able to afford rent and food and being able to pursue the career you want, that's why the plan exists. But it does mean that it's a problem. Well, a sort of, a sort of a solution, not a solution, but a way to help with that problem is that during the first three years you're in repayment, in IBR or in pay as you earn, 
If the amount of your monthly payment is not large enough to be covering all the interest that's accruing on your subsidized Stafford loans, even if you refinance those, subs those subsidized Stafford loans through consolidation, then the government is going to pay that portion of the interest on your subsidized Stafford loans that you're not paying with your minimum payment for up to the first three years. And that's a tax-free subsidy benefit. Now, the interest that's accruing on your unsubsidized loans is will be accruing as simple interest that's not getting paid. And after the three years, even on the subsidized loans, you'll no longer be getting that subsidy. And again, it will just be accruing as simple interest until one of two things happens. Either you no longer have a partial financial hardship because your income has now risen to the point where your monthly payment based upon your income would be greater than the amount you'd have to pay based upon your income, or you voluntarily choose to go to a different payment plan. At that point, the interest would have to be capitalized. What happens if you reach a point, as I said, where your income is higher than would require you to be paying an amount less than that uh, standard amount? Then you no longer have a partial financial hardship. Well, it's not that you're kicked out of IBR or pay as you earn. It's at that point, though, that your monthly payment becomes equal to what that original standard 10-year amount was. And you'd keep paying that amount until either the debt's paid off, the debt's forgiven, the debt's canceled, or you once again have a partial financial hardship. Or, if you weren't trying to take advantage of public service loan forgiveness, at that point you might decide to switch to a different payment plan. Now, if you want to apply for IBR or pay as you earn, which you're going to be applying for the payment plan that you want prior to the loan's entering repayment, which is going to be six months after graduating, in the case of your staff and grad plus loans from here at the law school, then you'll contact your current loan servicer. That's why you need to know who it is. They'll actually be contacting you just prior to the loan's entering repayment to let you know that it's time to prepare for repayment and it's time to choose your repayment plan. If you're choosing pay as you earn or IVR, there's actually an online application you have to fill out because you have to provide information about your income and your household size. And in terms of the income information they're going to ask for, is they're going to ask for information from your previous year's tax return. They're going to ask for the adjusted gross income figure that you reported on your previous year's tax return. But the, on the form, it also asks you the question, is your current income or your expected income over the next 12 months, do you anticipate that it's going to be significantly different from the income figure you reported on your previous year's tax return? They do not define what they mean by significant. But if it is, then you have to provide alternative documentation of what your income currently is or will be over the next 12 months. Because it could be that your income is going to be significantly larger, or conversely, it could be significantly less. In either case, it wouldn't be appropriate to use information that's now outdated. The reason they're using your tax return is because they prefer to use third-party docu verifiable documentation. And we assume that from year to year, your income is not changing significantly, so that whatever you had on your reported on your previous year's tax return should be significant, essentially the same for the coming year, unless you change jobs in some way. And they also have to collect the household size information. And they're going to have to, you're going to have to get that information collected every 12 months. So once you submit that form and you put on the plan, then 60 days before the end of that 12-month payment cycle, the servicer will notify you that it's time to now submit a new application, updating your income and household size information. Also note that if you're currently on the IBR plan, you'd have to first go to the standard payment plan for at least one month before you can switch to pay as you earn. That's a requirement of IBR. And also remember that if you have loans that are not direct loans, you are going to have to first refinance them through consolidation before that debt can be repaid using pay as you earn. And when you're filling out the consolidation application, one of the questions that you're asked is, what payment plan do you want for that new loan? All right, now I've given you two fact sheets one for income-based repayment, and one for pay-as-you-earn. And on the back side, they also happen to have sample payment charts that are in addition to what are in the handout of the slides. So I'd encourage you to read through these, because they give you basically all the information I've provided you in words. Any questions about IBR or pay-as-you-earn before we close with the sample case? Because this is the most exciting part of the whole presentation. All right. So I thought it would be helpful to see a sample. And there's only one calculator that currently exists that allows us to get an estimate of how much debt you might actually get forgiven through public service loan forgiveness. And it's available at a website called finaid.org slash calculators. And you'd want to go to the calculator that's for income-based repayment 
using either the 10, 15% formula for the traditional IBR or the IBR 10% formula, which I think it's been updated now that it's called the pay as you earn plan. I did the calculations using the 15% formula because the results are only more impressive for pay as you earn. And we've actually printed out the results of this analysis for you. And if we assume, If we assume that the amount of your debt at the start of repayment was $166,000, which was about the average amount owed by the class that graduated in 2012 from this law school. That's amount borrowed plus accrued interest while in school and during the grace period, and it represents only what was borrowed here at the law school. So I'm just using that as an example. And if your starting salary in public service was $49,000, which would be probably a little bit low for a government position, maybe a little bit high for public interest, and if we assume the interest was increased, the, your income is increasing at a rate of 3% a year, because I have to make some assumption about how income is changing over time. And if we assume that the poverty guideline was increasing at a rate of 3% a year, both of which may be a little bit too high under the current uh, rate of inflation. And if I assume the household size is one for the entire 10 year period, because unfortunately this calculator doesn't give me the ability to change the household size, which is a tenuous assumption, I, I, I understand. <laughs> And after 10 years, your income would have increased to $63,934. And under IBR, for the first 12 months, the monthly payment would be $403 every month for the first 12 months. Then it would increase every year, and by the 10th year, given that this was your income, the monthly payment would have increased to $526. Over that 120 month period of time, assuming it was 120 consecutive months that you didn't take any time off, you would have paid out a total of $55,448. So how much would be forgiven? Well, you would have $66,153 of interest that never got paid, but that accrued. And you would never have touched the principal. So the total amount forgiven would be $232,153. Now you should all be really excited about that. <laughs> but that is why I think you need to be aware that this program could get changed. Because the first time a taxpayer learns that a lawyer has had $232,000 of debt repaid by the government as a tax-free benefit, what do you think is going to happen? There's going to be debate. In fact, the debate started before the presidential election because a rather conservative think tank called the New America Foundation came out with a research paper that said the only people who are going to benefit from, in, from the new version of income-based repayment, pay as you earn, and from these other forgiveness and cancellation programs are lawyers and doctors. Now, it didn't say lawyers who are providing services to the underserved and who aren't making very much money. It just said lawyers. Now, that brought up a lot of interest in the press. Now, I'm not saying that they're right, and in fact, I think their analysis was quite flawed because it overlooked a lot of things. But I do think that it is the reason why there is the interest in some debate and why there will be ongoing debate and why there could be some changes made. Now again, you may get grandfathered in, the changes might not affect you, I don't know. But I just don't want you to count on this because this is almost a quarter of a million dollars. That's a lot of money. And with pay as you earn, it would only be bigger because you would have paid less, so there would be even more interest left to forgive. Now, I don't think that's a bad idea, both as an economist and as a taxpayer. But, you know, they're not asking Jeff Hansen for his opinion, all right? So just be aware of that. Now, any questions about that? All right, a few final comments. First of all, to remember, to benefit from public service loan forgiveness, you have to first of all make sure that all of your debt is eligible. And only direct loans are eligible, so you'd have to refinance the loans that aren't at loanconsolidation.ed.gov. You'd want to choose pay as you earn to repay your direct loans if you're eligible. If not, choose IBR. Make your 120 payments on time, but don't make them too soon. It has to be within no, no sooner than 20 days before the payment's due and no later than 15 days after it's due. And by the way, you can't make two months' worth of payments at once and have that count as two months. There have to actually be a 120 months of elapsed time, and during each of those 120 months, the only way the month counted was that a payment was made equal to the minimum amount required that month 
during that window of time, no sooner than 20 days before or 15 days later, and I just verified this with Fed Loan Servicing yesterday, because I didn't believe the front end part of it, but it is in fact the way they've got it set up. You have to uh, make sure you're supplementing the employment certification form. And if you're not doing that, make sure you're keeping good records about your employment. And by the way, you will see that on that employment certification form, on the section where the employer fills it out, I have heard anecdotally that there are some employers who have refused to fill out the form. I don't know why. If your employer is refusing to fill out the form, there is a little checkbox now on the form where you can check that. It doesn't mean that you've solved the problem. But it does mean that you're going to have to at least then keep track of that same information that your employer was being asked to provide on the form. So you want to get a letter from your employer on their letterhead basically stating all of that information that they were asked to check off on the form. So why they wouldn't just check off the form, I don't know. Because they're really not incurring any liability by simply answering those questions. Then after you've gotten the 120 months in, then you'd apply for the forgiveness. For more information, the best source of information is at studentaid.ed.gov slash public service. You want to go to what I call the horse's mouth, in this case, the Department of Education. For more information about student loan repayment in general, you can go to their general website, studentaid.gov. For loan consolidation, loanconsolidation.ed.gov. To know what loans you have, nslds.ed.gov. To do general calculations about your loans, I did all the calculations uh, leading up to that example on studentaid.gov. The example I actually calculated at finaid.org. If you want information from other sources that is going to be interpretational, but it still could be useful, there are two sources I can recommend. Equal Justice Works at equaljusticeworks.org. They are the uh, nonprofit organization that advocates on behalf of public interest attorneys. And also, an individual, Heather Jarvis, at her website, askheatherjarvis.com. She used to work for Equal Justice Works and, in fact, was involved quite heavily in the implementation and passage of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. And although these are great sources, they are simply going to be interpreting what the department says. So I'd always encourage you to start first with the department. Okay? Also be aware that the law school does have a loan repayment assistance program. And if you need more information about that, you go to the law school's website. If you want to talk to someone about it, who should the students talk to? You talk to Dean Benhart, and she will answer your questions. All right. The good news is that options exist to help you repay your federal student loans, even if you're planning a career in public service, and that your federal student loan debt shouldn't necessarily be a financial barrier from allowing you to pursue the career that you're most interested in. But you've got to pay attention to these programs. You've got to take charge of repayment. And you've got to understand the terms and conditions, as well as the limitations of these programs. Uh, as I said, we've given you a lot of handout materials. I encourage you to read through them. If you have follow-up questions, Joseph and Audrey certainly can answer those questions. You also can go to the sources I've indicated. Uh, the law school is interested in getting your feedback. So again, they've given you an evaluation form. They'd like you to fill out either before you leave, or if you have to leave, fill it out and turn it in to either Audrey or to Joseph in the financial aid office. Remember, uh, for the rest of this week, I am meeting with individual students. If you'd like to meet with me but have not yet scheduled an appointment, there are still some available slots on Thursday and Friday. You can check with Audrey and she can schedule in an appointment with you. With that, do you have any other questions? One more. Okay, the question is, or the comment is, there are some government agencies that provide for forgiveness of loans up to some limit. Uh, what I think you're talking about is not actually forgiveness, but loan repayment assistance. Loan repayment assistance is where someone is giving you money to help you make your loan payments. The law school has uh, a loan repayment assistance <coughs> program. Some employers do, including certain federal agencies, for example, JAG, the uh, military uh, positions. If you're in certain branches of the military, they're going to give you some funding as an incentive to join that, their forces. Uh, but this is money that they're giving you to help you make your loan payments. And yes, depending upon the department or the employer, they may limit how much they are able to give you each year, but that's subject to the terms of that particular entity's program. So you need to check with your employer. But that is not forgiveness. That's where they're actually giving you money to help you make your loan payments and getting you to the point where you're eligible for the forgiveness. Can you receive that and do the public? The, 
question is, can you receive loan repayment assistance